it's good to have you join us on this special edition of the exclusive and today i've come to discuss on a global mission and i am having with me on the program the primate of the province of rwanda anglican communion and the chairman of the Gafcon primates uh, in the person of the most reverend Dr. Lawrence Wanda. Your Grace, you are welcome on the show, sir. Thank you very much. It's good to be here. It's good to have you too. My name remains Corey the Akitunde. So let's ride on this episode of an interesting conversation with the Archbishop of Rwanda. Join us again. Your Grace. Let's start from your background. My background. Who is Archbishop Mbanda? Who is Archbishop Mbanda? Yes. Well, as you said, my name is Roram Banda. I'm from Rwanda. I was actually born in Rwanda and fled the country with my parents when I was about four years old. But before I go too far, I'm married to Shantar Banda. We have children, we have uh, three children and a son-in-law. And uh, we have grandchildren, we have two grandchildren. So of our children, two are living. One passed away last year. And uh, that is the family. But as I started saying, uh, my parents fled Rwanda when I was about four years old. We lived in different countries. We lived in the Congo for a short time. Then we went into Burundi, which is where really I grew up, in a refugee camp in Burundi. The refugee camp was not what you see today. The refugee camp was with little huts. Today you have tents. The refugee camp didn't have as many relief organizations attending to us during those days as we have today. Probably at that time you had the Red Cross and you had the World Food Program. And that was about it. But I grew up in that environment. Later on, it became more of a refugee resettlement. Finding food was very difficult. And so many people were dying, especially children and elderly, dying of malnutrition, dying of diseases children are more vulnerable to, and elderly people. And so I grew up in that settlement. We didn't have schools. My father started a school in the refugee camp, a school that came to grow to about 3,000. And he was the headmaster. And even though he was the headmaster, he didn't have the education. He had only finished grade six. And, but he, for about 10 years, he ran this school, hired the teachers. Most of the teachers were volunteers because they were all refugees and they were helping, no one got paid, uh, but even though later on they got to be paid a little bit. So let me say that up to grade four, almost five, we didn't have classrooms. We were under trees most of the time. Later on we got some shady looking uh, facilities that we were in. Initially we were writing on our arms and our thighs. We didn't, have, we didn't have exercise books and things like that. But by God's grace, I finished elementary school in the same place. Later on, I went to high school. And even that was very difficult. Because the high school in Burundi, refugee kids were limited to what we could uh, go to high school. They would only take a few. They had a quota system that only allowed a few Rwandan refugee kids. Privileged were Burundi kids. But even their country didn't have many high schools. They didn't have many schools. They had one university. It was a small university. So very education, very limited. But by God's grace, a friend of my father ended up introducing me to a mission high school. There was a combination of high school and Bible school. So that's where I went and finished that uh, 
Bible school after four years. It was tough. My parents could not pay. And so I learned to support myself by working for missionaries on a mission compound, whether it was cutting grass on a mission compound, whether it was working in a missionary's home, uh, washing dishes or washing cars, and I would get a little money that helped me pay school. And sometimes even go back and support my family. And uh, again, by God's grace, I finished my high school and it was tough finding a job. It was very difficult finding, uh, going to university in Burundi, mainly because of being a refugee. That limited everything almost. And so at that time, I decided I was going to explore and to adventure. So I left Burundi in 74, 1974, and basically walked to Kenya six months, almost 500 miles, following people who were doing smuggling, taking things from Burundi to Tanzania or smuggling within Tanzania and those that left Tanzania to go to Kenya. So it took me a long time to get there, but it was that kind of movement, moving with people that I didn't know, sometimes staying in the places that I didn't know, other places trying to stay in the marketplace because it was safer there. You know, these markets in many of our countries, especially in East Africa, they will be there during the day and when people go, they fold their things, leave them in the marketplace, and you have watchmen that watch those things. So I will stay with them. Long story short, I end up in Kenya, Nairobi. And in Nairobi, I lived on the streets for about two weeks and learned to beg and survived. And later on, in the whole park in Nairobi, I found People were preaching the gospel. I was already a Christian. People were preaching the gospel. And as I approached and I was listening, someone came to me. And as someone came to me, I started asking them questions. It's very Bible college here. It's very, very university here. And as they were sharing with me, I found a Bible college that somehow had the same background as the church that was started in the refugee camp that my father also served and the missionaries that I knew in Burundi, but it was the same mission, Africa Gospel Mission, or what was called World Gospel Mission at that time. So when they told me of their Bible college, I literally walked from Nairobi to that college. And again, about 250, uh, probably miles, and, but incremental walks, and it took me time, but I got there. When I got there, I didn't look like a student. <laughs> I didn't have much clothes on me. So everybody feared me. And when I knocked at this missionary's door and said, yeah, I'm here, I'm from Burundi, I wanted to see if I can be admitted in the school, she didn't give me a chance, it was a lady. Instead, she called somebody who talked to someone that someone they talked to had fled Burundi and was in Kenya as a refugee. And for some reason, they concluded that I, was, I had come to kill this particular person. Wow. So they took me and took me to the police station that evening. On the way going, I was nervous. So I kind of somehow got the steering wheel of the car and I said, if I'm going to die, you are also going to die. And there was somebody behind him in the bag with a rungu, which is a stick and a machete. And I was kind of somehow numb. Uh, but this lady said, no, 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 we are going to take you in a safe place where you can stay. So I end up in a, in, in a police station. <laughs> Stayed there overnight. And then the next day, and on the way going, I was telling her all the names of missionaries I knew in the Burundi to see if there would be any connection. But the next day she came to the police station, she said, give me my person, give me my person. And the reason is she had talked on a radio missionary call and told some missionaries that were from Burundi and told them about me. And they said, yeah, we know him. And so she came and got me out. She got me actually in a little motel 
and I stayed. And, um, and she took me back to school, to the school. She encouraged me to go back to Burundi and to get my transcripts and to get my diploma and to get an ID. I had traveled without an ID. I was sneaking. I didn't have a passport. I didn't even know what the passport was. All I had on me was what you call a student card, which really could not allow you to cross borders. And I was crossing borders because I would get at the border, I would wait and see people going to the market and I would follow them and I would cross. So long story short, I end up going back to Burundi and was there for a short time, got the papers that she needed and right away turned around. But this time I didn't walk because she gave me some shillings. And with those shillings, I bought a, a bus ticket and I could go back to Burundi and saved enough money to come back. And so when I came back, she didn't expect me back. When I came back, she was shocked. And uh, so when she saw me, she had no choice, but they admitted me in the school. And God provided miraculously. Even though the first year I had again to do the coop coop, to wash cars, to clean, to chop woods. But after that, um, World Council of Churches through AACC in Nairobi, provided the scholarship for me, wow. and um, which the school didn't take. The school didn't take the, the scholarship because they said, this money is from the liberals. We cannot take money from the liberals. So I ended up finding an American lady, young lady, that supported me with $300 that enabled me to get going. And from there, God provided the miraculous in many different ways. At the end of four years, they couldn't give me my diploma because I, they said I owed the school a little money. And so I said, well, I don't owe the school because you were given the money and you didn't want to take it. It was a long story. We went into discussions, but finally they gave me my diploma. Then I said, well, if you won't take that money from these people, can I go and claim it? And they said, it's your decision. So I went back to Nairobi, went to SEC, so these people didn't want to take your money because you are liberal very evangelicals. Can I have that money? Can you help me? I just go back to Burundi. So I got the money that would have paid for four years. And uh, I was able to equip myself and buy a ticket to go back to Burundi. Wow. I, maybe I can stop there and see what you yes, have. Yes, because uh, I, I wanted to, uh, I, I highlight the story because it's a story of a very tough, together. Uh, but what I want to ask, uh, why did you end up in the refugee camp? Who are your siblings? Well, in 1959, uh, in Rwanda, there was a civil war. It was a tribal war, if I can use that. And through this war, uh, our king was overthrown, and then killing started going on. And it was really what criminated climaxed into what we call the genocide against Tutsis more recently in 1994. So that whole thing started in the 1950s, 1959. There were a series of killing in between. And 1994, it was the big one that took over a million people in 100 days. So my parents fled the country in that initial stage of what some people call civil war, but it was really the beginning of the genocide that we experienced in Rwanda. And so when we fled, we were only two kids in the family, but my mother was expecting. So after she got across the border, she had the baby who was my brother. I come from a family of 10, and uh, uh, three have passed away, so seven are living, and I am the oldest. Oh, fantastic. So I was just thinking, through this uh, upgrade, upbringing, uh, what were your focus? Uh, you living from one refugee camp to the other. Uh, what were you thinking you could think of in life? Well, first of all, living in the refugee camp, there was no hope. All you wanted to do as a young person, or even a kid, was to get out of that place. 
And when I became a teenager, that was the goal. How can I get out of this refugee resettlement? So when I went to high school, it was a way out. And there were two things in my mind, or at least most of us. One, you thought education is my only way out that will help break the cycle of poverty. But when I was in elementary school, I always did some little business. I didn't go to school full time as other students from Monday to Friday. I went probably two days a week or three days a week because during the other days, I was doing some little selling of this, selling of this in order to support myself and to support the family. Remember, my father was a school teacher, but he was not being paid. So I was almost like the breadwinner of the family. My mother also worked very hard. I viewed education as my way out and the breaking of the circle of poverty. But then in education, I was thinking, okay, we were limited. We didn't know there were many different fields. All you knew was a nurse that you saw, was an agriculturist that you saw, was a, an administrator that you saw, was a, maybe a policeman. You didn't know these other fields. I probably would have been an engineer like you. <laughs> but you didn't know these other fields. And no one really prepared you for something like that. So I wanted to go to the university. I wanted to go as far as I could in education, but Burundi didn't give me a hope because we couldn't go to, that's why I went to Kenya. And when I got to Kenya, I went to a Bible college. And in the Bible college, when I finished Bible college, my dream was to someday work for a nonprofit Christian organization. There were a few that we knew. I knew of World Vision. I knew of the Bill Graham Association because of movies, small movies that you saw. But I didn't want to work full time for a church because I saw many people who were working in the church in the, in the refugee camp. They were really, really, really poor. Uh, even my father helped in the church. There was nothing. So, I, I, so I, I thought I would have a better life for myself and a better life for my, my future family if I had a family. So I was looking at where can I serve and serve God, but not in the church setting. The whole thing of parachurch organizations, I didn't know much, but I knew Christian organizations that were not church. I, at that time, I, I had not heard about the world and nonprofit organizations, or you know, all I knew was Christian organizations. So that was one of my dreams. I also had a dream from the time that I was in high school that I wanted to go to study abroad. I thought about Europe, I thought about America, but I didn't know how we would ever get there. But that was my ambition. Because that's, that's what we knew. In Burundi, if you finish a school and you didn't go to the National University or you went to the National University, you dreamed of getting a scholarship to go to France or to go to other places. So my dream was that someday I want to go to Europe. Better yet, I was really targeting the US, that I will go and get my education. And um, I wanted to do business. I love business. I could have been a good businessman. In fact, even today, I'm known as a social entrepreneur. And uh, that was the area that I was looking at that probably could help me. But by the time I finished college, a short life after I finished college in Kenya, I ended up with an organization called Campus Crusade, or Life Ministries. I actually had a boss from Nigeria called Yemila Dipo. Okay. He must be an old man now if yeah, he's still yeah. alive. Okay. And, uh, and I worked, he was the overall Africa director. And so I ended up with Campus Crusade, or he is life, or... Uh, uh, life ministries, as they call it, in many different countries, and I served there before going to the States for school. Fantastic. So, how did you know eventually get into the full-time ministry, church ministry? Why it is a long story. <laughs> as I told you, I started working with Campus Crusade, and I started working uh, in, uh, I left Burundi. I was invited by Campus Crusade to go help as a translator, I went to Kishasa. It was known as Zaire at that time. They needed somebody who can translate from English to French. So I went there, and I was going there for about two weeks. 
but I end up staying for two years because I think they liked what I was doing. I think they liked my personality and my attitude. I think they liked my Christian commitment. I was a hard working person because I had early survival skills in television camp and other places. I also wanted to impress people because I knew that the relationship and network is what will get me somewhere. So um, they end up hiring me to be the translator and the administrator of the center. Later on, I ended up uh, being a teacher at the center. It was a center where we were training Campus Crusade staff from all French-speaking countries. So I served there for two years. And then uh, after the two years, they thought that I would do well to help other French-speaking countries. So they sent me to Ivory Coast for a year. I went to Ivory Coast, I served there. I didn't stay for a year, I stayed for about eight months. Then I left Ivory Coast to go back to Burundi to help launch Campus Crusade in Burundi. It had started, but, st uh, but failed. And they wanted me to go kind of somehow rescue, revive it. And I went there and I had a very successful ministry in Burundi. We grew from five staff members to 27. And we grew from a budget of uh, $500 plus 1000 that they were giving us for operations to $5,000. US dollars. Now, this is 81, 82. That, in a way, was a lot of money at that time. And so I served there. And my whole goal was that though I was serving, I still wanted to do education. I still wanted to go to school. So while I was working and serving and happy, many of the interactions I was having with uh, many of the Americans we were working with, they all affirmed that if God opened the door and went to do my master's, that I really would be um, a key person in serving in the ministry that I was in and in other places for that matter. But my goal was, I don't want to go to the state single. I wanted also to find a wife. I was in my upper 20s. And I thought, well, it would be good, nice to go to the West with a Rwandan wife, if I can. So by God's grace, I found a, a young lady. In fact, my friend won her to Christ. She started attending my church and joined the choir. And before long, we were dating. And we became good friends. We introduced each other, uh, our families to each other. And then, uh, and then shortly I got engaged. And we got married in April of 1984. And in June, two months only, we were on the way to the States. So our honeymoon was on the way to the States. And uh, went to Fuller Seminary, was there for a short time. Um, I was kicked out because I didn't have the scholarship. I went without knowing where the money would come. I had a little money. I thought it would be enough, but it wasn't. And so, so I got in the U.S. I started, paid the little money that I had, and had no more money coming, and uh, got kicked out. And we went instead with friends in Arizona, Mesa, Arizona. And those friends introduced me to another school in Colorado, Denver, Colorado. So I went to a Baptist seminary, actually called Denver Seminary. And I was there again in a scholarship, was admitted in a very short time, in a miraculous way, uh, but God did it for me. Maybe you don't have the time to go into those details, but also at that seminary, God provided for our needs. I worked hard, I did a clean classroom, I did everything you can think of to support ourselves. But at the same time, the school gave me tuition, uh, scholarship, and I paid only one third. And I finished school, my master's, without any debt. And by then, my wife was also doing all kinds of jobs to support babysitting and other things. Then I went on to do my PhD and did my PhD in education with emphasis on higher education and uh, finished my PhD and the same week I finished my PhD, I was reading a magazine and I saw an organization that was looking for an Africa director. 
And they explained one with French, Swahili, and understands African culture. I picked up a phone and I called them, this person you are looking is me, except he didn't put my name on. <laughs> and they said, yeah, you believe he's you? I said, yes. So he called me and he said, why don't you come for an interview? I went, I said, I don't have money to come. He said, no, we will fly you here. So they flew me to Virginia from Denver, Colorado. And I went there, they interviewed me, and they offered me a job. So I became Africa director for that particular ministry and went and moved my family. It was a Christian organization called Christian Aid. And I actually worked with a number of ministries here in Nigeria and other places because it was assisting indigenous missions. And so I spent time there, two years. My wife started a little business of buying used clothes from Salvation Army and other organizations that sold used clothing. And we started folding them nicely, cotton, whatever, jeans here, and we fold them and we ship them to Africa. And before long, it became a big business. We were shipping containers, maybe four to five containers a month. And so the business went extremely well for about two years, and then we lost a number of containers in Kenya because of the political situation, and our business started going down. But by then, we had bought our own house. We actually were on a second house. We had helped some of our springs to come to the city to study. And during that downtown of the business is when an organization called me and wanted to offer me a job. So I went for an interview with International Bible Society but on the side, I also went for an interview with Compassion International, wonderful organization. And the two organizations knew I was being interviewed by both because the person who had referred me to the, them was the same. And they were kind of somewhat trading and being careful how, I, how they talked to me. But I ended up getting a job with Compassion International, and, uh, which was based in Colorado Springs. It's a child development organization. And in that organization, God blessed me tremendously because I then was sent to Nairobi to work as an expatriate from the U.S. to Nairobi, which get a special treatment, served there for a few years, for about two years. But during that time is also when the genocide happened in Rwanda. And I went on a reef convoy to help uh, rescue people, feed the people in Rwanda. Long story short, started as Africa program director, and within three years, I was a senior vice president at the international level and best in the U.S. And uh, then 2003, I felt like God was calling me and my family, it's a long story, I didn't go into it, to move back to Africa and particularly in Rwanda, where my roots were, where my wife's roots was, and a place where we had never lived. And so we talked as a family, we visited Rwanda, we saw Rwanda, we liked what we saw. I came back, I resigned my job. And when I resigned my job, uh, it was very difficult because shortly after I resigned, I realized that I'm going to go to Rwanda, but I don't have a way of getting there. I could buy a ticket for myself, but five people, moving our things, moving everything. Rwanda, I don't have a job. My son challenged me and he said, do you have a job you're going to do? I said, no. And we started looking. And that time is like the devil really started showing me all the impossibilities of moving. Mm. But God opened the door. Mm. Within a very short time, a compassion came back to me and said, you have resigned, but we don't want to lose you. What can we do to keep you? Wow. And uh, after some discussion, they gave me a one-year assignment in Nairobi and moved me and my family and everything I owned, including my little dog. <laughs> we moved to, they paid the whole thing. Wow. We got to Nairobi. When we got to Nairobi, the assignment, I did it in six months because I hired extra hand to help me. It was writing a curriculum on HIV AIDS. And I hired two medical doctors. I said, I don't know anything about HIV yet. Can you help him with this? So by the six months later, we were done with the curriculum. Went back, presented it, and after presenting it, they said, we know where your heart is. 
you want to move to Rwanda, you can move to Rwanda. And at this time, they put me on a special assignment for the reorganization of the organization, wow. reorg. And I was put on in that team. And um, after doing the reorganization, they said, well, you can move the office, the Africa office that was in Nairobi to Kigali. So I moved in Kigali, and shortly after the reorganization, they organized the organization into three regions, Asia, Latin America, and Africa, and they asked me to be the vice president for Africa. It was a step down from where I was, but it was still honoring, and the fact that I was living in Rwanda, being paid as an American, and being the home where I want to be, an expatriate in my own country, wow. in a way. And these NGOs, sometimes they can take good care of you. Yeah. And they took good care of me. So I was in that position for five years. My role was to expand the ministry in Africa. I was able to start working in Burkina Faso, work in Ghana, work in Togo, and of course, work with some of my team. And after five years, 2010, my church approached me. Not many people knew that I was an ordained priest. But they approached me, but some knew. They approached me and asked me if I would pray and consider to be a candidate for bishop. So That's how I entered the full time. Let's go on this break before we get more details on how you became a bishop and how the Anglican Church in Rwanda is doing. It was, it's been an interesting discussion. I think we are speaking with a man of full of grace. We'll be right back after this short break. All right, thank you. We've been speaking with the Archbishop of Rwanda, and uh, it's been a very interesting discussion. I'm sure you've been very uh, much glued to your screen to listen with rapt attention to his background that's is so inspiring to many of us, I think. Uh, Your Grace, one can say that you had a very, very rough background, but uh, with God compensating you with a lot of things. So let me take you back a bit. Uh, you talked about meeting your wife, who was a choir member and all that. Uh, so um, share with us uh, what, what draw your attention to her. So first of all, let me say that uh, when I met my wife, as I said, I was working for Campus Crusade. Yeah. And my ministry was focusing on churches and on university students. Okay. So we were showing the Jesus fear in villages, in churches, but also in universities. Okay. And I was helping a team. I was blessed by being innovative with Campus Crusade. Hmm. Because in the Campus Crusade, you are supposed to raise your own support. Okay. And raising your own support in Africa was a challenge. And so I came up with an idea. Rather than raising our own support as a staff, what if we raised money hmm. to help the ministry, but used in-kind donations? Hmm. So I came up with this idea. When we went to show the Jesus film, people could take a collection, but we asked them not to take money, to give money. But to give anything else they could. So people were giving goats, chicken, flour, fish, I mean, you name it. Mm. We will collect all those things and take them to the market and sell them. Wow. And we actually got more money than what Campus Crusade was giving us for operations. Mm. And that money we were getting for operations, then I turned around and used it to pay my staff because it was coming regularly. Mm -hmm. And the money we raised in kind, I used it to do the ministry, the, the, you know, uh, show the Jesus film, buying mm -hmm. the gasoline, mm -hmm. and everything that we could do in that mm -hmm. area. Mm -hmm. So something happened that someone reported that I had violated Campus Crusade policy okay. of raising personal support and used, rather using money that I was given to support my staff. Hmm. And so that became an argument between my direct boss and what was the Africa director. Hmm. And they, they collided. And so when they collided, it was reported all the way to the headquarters of Campus Crusade. Hmm. So I was invited to the U.S. to actually explain what I was doing in Burundi. 
So I flew to the States in 1982. It was the first time going to the States. Mm. And for me, I thought I was going to be fired. But I said, even if I'm fired, at least I've been in America. <laughs> <laughs> so I went to the US and I got there and I explained the situation. When I explained what I was doing, mm -hmm. the president, the founder of Campus Crusade, actually took a Bible, wrote my name in, and gave me a Bible and said, go, God bless you, and continue doing what you're doing. Wow. But that ended up being an opportunity for me to stay in the States for about three months oh. and traveled with my boss to raise the money for the organization. Mm -hmm. And after three months, I left with some trucks for the ministry in Burundi, mm. with some projectors mm. and with some uh, generators. Oh. Enough money to buy generators. We okay. use generators and projectors and trucks. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. But also something happened that when I went back to Burundi, I had met a friend who gave me uh, almost 12 of everything. Mm. So I went back with 12 jeans, uh, western shorts, cowboy hats, and a uh, something that they called at that time a Walkman stereo. Okay. A Walkman stereo was a little machine mm. that you put a cassette in, mm -hmm. it was a stereo, and mm. you could put it, attach it in a pocket. So I went back to Burundi and uh, got there and it looked, of course, almost like a cowboy. <laughs> now, here is the interesting part. Mm. I was in my house, I had a house, and my neighbor, they were going to have a wedding in the family. And they asked me if I can help. Mm. But at that place, my then wife came. She was a family related to that family. So she came to also help the wedding. Okay. And people saw me wearing this thing, listening to the Walkman stereo. Mm. And of course, the young girls came and they wanted to hear my music. <laughs> and it was a Christian music. It was this um, uh, Bill Carpenter and others. And I didn't want to give them. But I said, that one can listen. And if you want to listen, she can hold for you. <laughs> and so that's my current wife. So I gave her and she listened. They didn't like because the music sounded a little bit different. Oh. It was a Christian music. Then they asked me to help take people to the wedding because I had a small box wagon. Okay. She happened to be part of the people that I took in the car. Oh. Then the next day they said, oh, she's going in town, that's where home, uh, uh, can you drop her? I said, sure, I dropped her. But by then, the eye was, uh, had, had spotted somebody, and I, this time <laughs> I'll try to figure out, is she a Christian or not? Mm. So I called a friend of mine, I said, hey, let's go visit. Mm. She was running a shoe store for her daddy. And I took my friend and I said, we need to go, I'll show you something. Because we, we had covenanted, we were three of us, we had covenanted, we would protect each other, mm. we would help one another, mm. we were young Christians, mm. we wanted to be successful. Mm. So I went and I showed, and I said, mm, maybe she's not a Christian. Mm. We used to carry what we call the four spiritual laws in our pocket. It's a booklet that we shared, used to share the gospel. So my friend shared with her and invited her to church. That's how she joined our church. That's how she joined the choir. Oh. In the church, I was very active. I was known for that. And uh, I have already said how we met, but mm. it took two years. Mm. And within those two years of dating and getting to know the family that we got married. Mm. But the church in Burundi, the Anglican church in Burundi knew me as a very active young person in the church. Okay. With an evangelist mm. going to show the Jesus film, yeah. doing an outreach at the university. Mm. We were actually four of us and we had we had helped the church grow. Mm. So when I went to the States as a student, All right. the bishop said, we want you to go as a church commissioner, but we want you to be our commissioner in the U.S. And that was the bishop of Burundi? Burundi. Okay. When I went in the U.S., I found that this Episcopal Church of America was too liberal for me. Mm. I could not stand it. So I didn't engage. Instead, I went into some community Bible churches mm. that were non-Anglican. But after we had been there, remember I went in 1984. Mm. In 1988, one of my friends had already become a priest in the Anglican church. He one of the one I was working with. Yes. Was working with. Yeah. And so 
he talked to the bishop, he said, oh, we should ordain Bada. So the bishop called me and he said, we want you to come back to Burundi. I said, for what? He said, we want to ordain you deacon. So I flew back to Burundi by myself. I didn't even take my wife. Wow. I was ordained deacon. Wow. Came back to the States hmm. and kept doing what I was doing, but tried to connect with some of the Anglican churches that were more evangelical. Okay. A year later, I was invited back, hmm. 99, and I was priested. Wow. And again, he sent me back to America as his contact or as the commissioner of the Church of Burundi to the U.S. Wow. And at that time, I was speaking interest because I was already, I had already known the pastors in Burundi, so I started going back and forth, teaching pastors mm. and training. I started raising money to help pastors, to roof churches, to buy bicycles and things like that. Mm. When I joined the organization, I told you I was working for Africa Director for Christian Aid, yeah. which is the organization I worked for. Mm. After I left that organization, I started a ministry called CARM, Christian African Leadership Ministry. Okay. And the idea, I was in business, so I could give money to the ministry, to the ministry and yeah. encourage others to give money to the ministry. Mm. And then I would take time off and go to Africa and do training of pastors, start vocational schools, and um, like, like welding or driving mm. or, you know, all kind of vocational technical. Mm. And I was doing it in Burundi, I was doing it in Kenya, I was doing it in Uganda, mm. in my free time after the business. Wow. After the business and went to, come to Compassion, I continued, didn't find that organization still exists today. <laughs> and it enables me to do some, some, wow. some things. So that is my ministry uh, as an ordained deacon in Burundi, priesthood in Burundi, but lived in the U.S., worked in parachurch organization, went into business, went into compassion, and really never said where I'm pastoring, but uh, I was doing side ministries that were helping and encouraging pastors. That's mm. how people came to know me okay. in Burundi and Rwanda and even in Kenya, mm -hmm. even though I was with this big organization. Mm -hmm. So when I went back to Rwanda, I actually went and introduced myself to the bishop of Rwanda, who was also of Kigali, who was also the Archbishop. Okay. He knew me already. He knew I had been ordained. He knew I was engaged in the ministry. He knew I was doing side ministries. And so he attached me to the cathedral. Okay. I was an attached priest to the cathedral, to the cathedral. for the five years that I was still with working with compassion. Okay. And it was during that time then, I was also training and helping pastors. I was making uh, good money. And so I would give my time but I never wanted to give my whole time to the church, the church. because it was way too much. <laughs> and I didn't want, maybe I didn't also want, to be honest, I didn't want to know how much I was earning. <laughs> but also I thought, well, if I give them this, it may discourage others. To mm. So my wife and I, we will orient our giving to different projects. Okay. We take the money and do different projects. Mm. I remember one time with another friend, we equipped the whole church, the whole cathedral with benches. Wow. And so we'll do little projects like that, that we'll do. That's why five years later, I was in my office. And the bishop, one bishop came and he said, we have been praying for the last four years. Wow. And praying for you. And we think you will be the right person to replace this bishop who is retiring. Now that came as something that came like this because I, I had really not dreamed. I thought I was doing full-time Christian ministry with the organization I was with. Mm. I had my own organization on the side mm. and uh, I had kids that were in college, private university, mm. those in high school, the organization I was working with was paying for them. He was in Germany, studying in an American school in Germany. The others were in the US mm. and I was thinking, well, this comes and I have never thought about it. Wow. When he broke that idea, he said, and something to pray for. We think you can be a good bishop, you think you can impress the person, but there is a process that one has to go through, mm. but you don't tell anybody. Mm. Because this is something that we have to discern. And if you tell it out there, you know, people may start talking. Mm. And I thought, how does a bishop live? That was the question my wife and I asked. So he explained, and I thought, ah, this is not us. <laughs> <laughs> he 
He said, no, don't say like that, go pray. So we went and prayed. We went actually through to Burundi, met our friends, and I shared a little bit. I had this team that we have known in high school, that we did everything together. This is the team that also got me to be ordained. Mm. Up to now we are friends. We were singles. We got married in the same year. And we held each other accountable. Up to now we are very, very close families. Mm. So we went and we shared. And both of them said, oh, praise the Lord. You finally have, are coming into full-time ministry. Mm. Maybe this is the time to forget all the American hamburgers and everything. <laughs> and, uh, and that didn't help. Because mm. I wanted something to affirm that I was already doing Christian ministry, that I was doing. I, I didn't want somebody to sway me this way. I wanted somebody to affirm me who I was. And everybody I talked to and prayed with, nobody affirmed that. Instead, they said they couldn't have found a better man. Hmm. So at that time, time came, and I said to the bishop, you know what, you can take my name. Nobody knows me up there. It was way up north in the northern part of the country. It was not even the capital. No one knows me, and if they end up electing me, that will be of God's plan. And that's what happened. They end up electing me, and I end up being a bishop. Wow. So you were, you were bishop of which diocese at this point? I was a bishop of Shira Diocese, which is in the northern part of Rwanda. Okay. It was a diocese that um, literally was bankrupt when I took it. We were $3 million in debt. Wow. I had no idea. I landed in that place, let me tell you, the first two weeks. We were strategizing, how do we quit mm. and quietly leave, mm. go back to Kigali mm. and take a plan, go, go back to Demba where we live as a family. Because we had the house there. Mm. And, but by God's grace, we struggled for about two years. Mm. The big thing was a hotel that we had that uh, was really eating us alive, which is, we had much of the debt. Mm. But by God's grace, we were able to sell the hotel, we were able to settle the, the debts, we were able to take the debt off. In fact, by the time we left the diocese, mm. we had built a new small guest house and had built a commercial building that was bringing in over 120000 dollars a year wow. and had started a polytechnic college that has now grown to 3,000 people, the students, wow. Wow. which offers an associated degree. And we were able to buy a new car for the bishop, we were able to build a new house for the bishop. Today that diocese is probably the most stable and healthier diocese in Rwanda mm. than the other ones. Wow. Wow. And so when we left, that diocese. I was going to go back to the organization I served. So I retired a, a year and four months early. And I was offered the job to go back to my previous organization. Okay, okay, so but let me have what's the time frame of being a bishop in Rwanda? For us in Rwanda, you go to 65. Okay. So uh, you go to 65. Okay. So I retired like uh, like uh, when I was almost a 63 okay. and a half. Okay. Because I had found a replacement, I had trained somebody, I had facilitated everything to happen. Mm. He had been elected, he mm. was my coadjutor. But then I realized I don't want to keep him too long in the waiting. Mm. But at the same time, after I left the Compassion, they brought me back as vice chair of the international board. Okay. And so at the, at the, during that time, they said, well, we have a position that we think you'll be better suited for, and mm. you are soon going to retire. Do you mm. want to come back? Mm. And I said, well, I have somebody to replace me. I can come back now. And so they hired me as executive director of board engagement. Okay. And I went back, told the church, mm. we settled things, and we started the new bishop. Mm. I sold my house. I sold everything I could sell at that time that I had. And in the process, we had three months to move back to the States. And then a group of bishops came to my house. Some of them are here today. Mm. They came to my house, they said, we need to pray with you. We prayed. After praying, they said, we believe that you might, we need you as a, the next archbishop. 
Mm. Please don't go anywhere. That was in November of 2017. Mm. So I, I was not sure. We started praying, and um, I didn't want to say no to my organization because they had already offered me a job didn't, because I didn't know what was going to happen because it's my election. Mm. January 17, 2018, we had our House of Bishops. Mm. It was an election day. Mm. I was elected Archbishop with <laughs> one year and six months to go <laughs> oh. to the retirement. Wow. So I had to go back and flood to the States and tell Compassion I would not come to work. So mm. That was the time we were also planning for the Jerusalem 18. And then we went to Jerusalem 18. I was elected as Archbishop and I was installed. But uh, 2018, we went to Jerusalem that same year yeah. because I was installed on uh, June 10. Okay. And we went to Jerusalem right after that. Yeah. And when we were in Jerusalem, we met as Bishop from Rwanda. I took the whole group. I raised the man that took the whole group. But when we were very very said, what is your vision? So mm. I restated my charge that I had given as Archbishop. Mm. And they said, you don't have enough life. We want to give you five years. Wow. So, so they gave me five years, but we had to come back to the Synod so and fun. share with them the desires of the bishop. Mm. And so it was approved. So I was given five years instead of one year and a half. Wow. In 2000, uh, last year in November, the year before November, yes. they met again and they said, you have quite a number of projects going on. We would like to extend your time and give you four more years. So literally, rather than retiring in 2023, June, mm. I'm going to be retiring in 2026, October, which is my birthday. Wow. So they extended that time. Wow. Meanwhile, uh, with all that happening, mm. I was also elected chairman of GAFCO. GAFCO. Uh, last year, yeah, uh, in Kigali, mm. I've been a member of the Gafcon family since 2008. I was even before I became bishop. The bishop. I wow. was involved in the theological commission. I was with your bishop Dapo yeah, and okay. others. <laughs> and uh, then, um, so I've known Gafcon for many years. Mm. I've been part of almost all of the meetings, mm. officially and unofficially. Mm. And uh, I love this movement. Mm. It is a movement that I believe, by God's grace, will help restore the Bible to the South. Mm. Thank you very much. I think we'll pause on this episode as the part one of this interview. Uh, and then we'll continue in the second part, same time next week, as we look at the Church of Rwanda and uh, the Gafcon as a family. Uh, we'll be speaking with Archbishop Laurent Banda, the primate of the province of Rwanda, Anglican Communion. And it's been a, an interesting time, Your Grace, speaking with you on this episode. So join us again in the next episode with our bishop as we continue this conversation. God bless you. Thank you.